Retro computing has always been a hobby of mine. I even have a bumper sticker on my car which confirms this. Unfortunately, there are many problems that plague 80s computers in the 2020s. After four decades, things are bound to go wrong. Problems such as components going bad, original parts being hard to find, and when you can't find them, they're usually overpriced. And then how do you get software on your old machine? Fortunately though, over the past several years, people have developed some pretty unique ways of solving all of these problems. In this video, I'm going to talk about some of my favorite modern solutions to old computer problems, specifically for the Apple II. I'm actually fortunate enough to have two different models of the Apple II. The Apple IIe Platinum Edition from 1987 and the Apple II GS from 1986. First off, let's talk about software. A computer isn't much use without it. It isn't like you can just go to Toys R Us anymore and buy a bunch of software like you could in the 80s. Sure, you could find an original box of discs on eBay, but that's a risk because there's no guarantee that any of those discs even work anymore. That's where a website called Big Mess of Wires comes in handy. They sell a device called Floppy Emu, which is a floppy disk drive emulator for the Apple II, Lisa, and Macintosh computers. The way it works is you load your favorite disk image files onto a micro SD card, boot the machine, select the disk image file to run, and the computer does the rest. I've had mine for five years now, and it served me well this entire time. I've since bought two accessories for it, the Noisy Disk and Daisy Chainer. The noisy disc knocks and makes the sounds of an Apple floppy drive to make the experience a little more realistic. Just take a listen. The daisy chainer comes in handy if you plan to use your floppy emu alongside a real disc drive. Because of Apple II's daisy chaining rules, the computer will only boot from the first device in the daisy chain. The daisy chainer allows you to make the floppy emu that device. I use it to copy software to physical disks. I've actually copied so much software to disk, I don't really use my floppy emu all that much anymore. Overall, Floppy Emu is, in my opinion, a must-have for any retro Apple user, especially if you plan to run GEOS, which brings me to my next solution. GEOS was a graphical operating system from Berkeley Software that became popular in the late 1980s. It was a game-changer for a lot of older systems like the Apple II. The only extra hardware you needed was a mouse and interface card, which could be bought as a set from Apple. Today, Apple mice from the 1980s are becoming expensive online, and the interface card needed to use them is even more expensive and rare. Fortunately, there are modern solutions to both these problems. First is the A2 USB version 1.2, a mouse interface card that can be used with any USB mouse. It works very well with software which takes advantage of it. Mine came with the A2 USB, instructions, and an adapter cord. The individual who sells the A2 USB is in the process of building their online store, but you can still buy the A2 USB if you email chris at 8bitdevices.com. What about using an Apple mouse? I personally didn't want to use just any USB mouse with my Apple IIe. This is a 3D printed optical USB mouse that looks and feels just like a real Apple mouse. The build quality is great, and it works perfectly with the A2 USB card. A perfect blend of modern technology and 1980s styling. Now I can take full advantage of GEOS, Multiscribe, and any other GUI software for the Apple II. Sounds great, right? Speaking of sound, it is a pretty big limitation on the 8-bit Apple IIs, unlike the advanced sound of the 16-bit 2GS. The 2E and previous models all have the same primitive sound that goes back to when the Apple II came out in 1977. It's basically a single voice that can be chirped or clicked at different frequencies to create different tones. It was great in 1977, considering the competition didn't have any sound capabilities, but by the mid-80s, its primitive sound was a big limitation to the system. Just listen to Donkey Kong on the Nintendo, and on the Apple II. It was such a big limitation that third-party sound cards had been developed. One that has gained popularity in recent years is the Mockingboard from Reactive Micro. The Mockingboard card gives the Apple II a few more different voices which can be used to create better sounding music. Software like Music Construction Set and Skyfox take advantage of this. Reactive Micro sells the Mockingboard in a build-it-yourself kit form or assembled. I bought mine as a kit because I enjoy soldering. 
It really wasn't hard to build, and anyone with basic soldering skills can put it together. The mocking board is capable of stereo sound, however, I tied both channels to the single speaker in my Apple IIe. It sounds great. Take a listen to Sky Fox on the mocking board. All these accessories are great, however, not much use if your machine has a worn out power supply. Reactive Micro also builds great Apple II power supplies. They have a number of different options on their website to choose from. I bought the Universal PSU kit and put it in my Apple II GS. It's great because it uses a lot fewer components which in turn uses less power and generates less heat. It is designed to fit perfectly inside of an original Apple II power supply case. It will keep my 2GS running for years to come and I can make lots of good memories with it. The Apple II GS actually has a lot of room for memory expansion, a lot more than most other machines from its time period. The 2GS shipped with a RAM card like this which could be populated with more chips to expand the memory. It was expandable up to 8 megabytes, which was huge, a lot like this memory board it uses. The memory chips can be a bit of a pain to track down, assuming they even work anymore. A modern memory solution is really the way to go. I replaced this huge memory board with this very small RAM GS4 card from GG Labs. It has three very small chips that contain 4 megabytes of RAM and a fraction of the physical size. 4 megabytes is honestly more than enough to do anything on the Apple II GS. This costs $79, which isn't terribly expensive. Since it has far fewer components than the original memory board, it uses less power and puts less of a strain on the power supply. Well, there you have it, a few of my favorite modern solutions for the Apple II. There are many more out there that I didn't talk about, but these are just a few that I've picked up over the years and have gotten to use. They make owning an Apple II a lot easier 40 years later. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and maybe even learned something. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to get away as I accidentally accessed a military supercomputer with my Apple II and almost started World War III.